Are you Ian Charles Whiting? I am. You are indicted of assault with intent to cause grievous bodily harm in that you did on October 7th of last year attack and batter your wife, Jennifer Whiting, thereby causing her grievous bodily harm. How do you plead? Not guilty. Uh, my Lord, I'd like to start by explaining how this case comes to be in the Crown Court today. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Parsons. It, it's rather cold. Is there something wrong with the heating? My Lord, uh, my Lord I, I believe there's been some problem with the boiler. And I understand that the uh, boilerman is uh, looking into it at the moment. Well, looking into the boiler? The repairing of, my Lord. Oh, I see. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Parsons. My Lord, perhaps I might explain how this case comes to be in this Arctic court today. Yes, we don't want the jury to catch cold, do we, Mr. Parsons? Uh, no, indeed, my Lord. I do believe the forecast is for sunny period this afternoon. Oh, good, thank you. Well, shall we proceed with the case then, Mr. Parsons? Uh, my Lord. Now, after the alleged battery, Mrs. Whiting took out a private summons against her husband. This was heard at the magistrate's court. However, the hearing was stopped when the magistrates decided that the charges were too serious for them to deal with, and they decided to commit the proceedings to the Crown Court. Is Mrs. Whiting still living with her husband? Uh, no, my lord. In fact, a separation order was granted on the grounds that Mrs. Whiting's leaving of the matrimonial home was constructive desertion on the part of the husband. I see. My lord, I'd like to call... Uh, one moment, Mr. Parsons. Members of the jury, I would just like to clarify for you the term constructive desertion... When a wife leaves her husband... I don't think I can. What? Go through with it. Oh, it's just this place. Don't let those gowns and curly wigs fool you. He says that he wants me back. You've seen him? Yes, yesterday in the park when I took the children out. He had no right. He must have followed you. You see, as long as I don't see him, it's all right. I can make the break. He needs me. Now, Jenny, you can't go back to a man who's battered you. He says that he loves me. He wants me back. It'll never happen again. He said that he's sorry. How sorry? What? Sorry enough to admit that he's guilty in court. Don't fool yourself. Mrs. Anne Stratton. Mrs. Stratton. Take the book in your right hand and read the word. I wish to affirm. Mrs. Whiting claims that on the 7th of October, her husband Sorry, arrived home so drunk and that he attacked and battered her, deliberately breaking her nose and the fingers of her right hand. Mr. Lloyd appears for the defence. Prosecuting for Mrs. Whiting is Mr. Parsons. Mr. Justice Stoddard presides in the case of Whiting uh, against Anne Whiting. Stratton of uh, Seven Chisholm Place, Fulchester. Mm, that's right. And you are the sister-in-law of the accused. I'm his wife's sister. Yes, I see. Now, Mrs. Trenner, I'd like to tell the court uh, what happened on the evening of October the 7th last year. I was at home. At about a quarter to ten, there was a phone call. It was my sister, Jennifer. Well, she sounded in a terrible state. She wasn't making sense. She kept sobbing. We well, trying to talk, but, but just sobbing. So I said that I'd come straight round. And then she told me that she wasn't at home, but she was at a neighbour's house. She gave me the name of the house, Oakfields, I drove like hell and got there about 15 minutes later. Yes. And um, how was your sister when you arrived? Well, she was in a state of silent shock. Mrs. Woolgar, the neighbour, was bathing her face. There was blood still coming from her nose. Her hair was wet and her left eye was beginning to swell. Well, when Jenny saw me, she, she tried to get up, but it, it seemed difficult for her to move. So I went to her to put my arms around her, but she, she drew back as though she were in pain. Then the coat fell from off her shoulders, and I saw that there were some red marks on her arms and some black marks where the bruises were beginning to come out. I thought she'd been in an accident. My God, I wish someone would do the same to him. Mrs. Stratton, you will confine yourself to uh, answering counsel's questions. Now, Mrs. Stratton, as a result of the injuries your sister had received, what did you do? I drove her to Whitefields Hospital. When we got there, they told us that the casualty unit was closed, so we had to go to Fortress General. That took about 20 minutes. God help anyone who has a serious accident in Whitefield. Yes, uh, my lord, uh, members of the jury, I'd like to draw your attention to the medical report. Mr Lloyd. Uh, yes, my lord, the report has been agreed by the defence. No, thank you, Mr yeah. Parsons. My lord. Uh, now, the doctor at the hospital diagnosed broken nose, broken fingers in the right hand, and severe bruising of the body. Now, did your sister say what had happened? 
She told me that she'd been in a fight with her husband. So I asked the doctor, well, what should we do? Should we call the police? And he said it was his job to treat the injuries, and that was all. So I said, well, what do you think I should do? Her husband did this. And he said, oh, this sort of thing happens between husband and wife in the heat of the moment. Well, I was staggered. I said, look, look, my sister's lying there, broken and, and bashed about. That isn't one heat of the moment thump. He said it was no part of his job how the injuries were inflicted. So I said, look, there has been a sustained attack upon my sister. The Lord. And I said it quite slowly so that he'd understand me. I said her husband came home drunk and laid into her. My Lord, this is plainly hearsay. Yes, Mr. Parsons. Uh, my Lord. Uh, Mrs. Stratton, we are concerned only with what you actually saw and heard and not with what you were told. I see. The other isn't relevant, is it? Well, if you didn't see and if you didn't hear, you do not know for a fact. The do fact you, is that my sister was battered by that monster. No, I will not allow this. Members of the jury, you will disregard that last remark. You will also disregard how Mrs. Stratton thinks her sister sustained her injuries. Mr. Parsons, your witness appears to be in a very emotional state. That's totally unfair. You wouldn't say that about a man? Mrs. Stratton, your emotional condition will not prevent me from holding you in contempt if you continue. Now, uh, Mrs. Stratton, the doctor at the hospital said it wasn't part of his duties to inquire how your sister's injuries had been sustained. So, what did you do next? In spite of the doctor, I insisted that we called the police. Yes. About an hour later, an officer arrived and took notes. Yes, and then what happened? Well, then I asked the doctor whether he thought Jenny ought to spend the night in hospital. Yes. He said that she should. And how did your sister react to that? Well, she wanted to get back because of the children. So then I asked the policeman whether he'd come back with us. He pulled a face and looked at his watch, but in the end he condescended to come. Are you suggesting that the police officer was unwilling to accompany you and your sister? Yes, that is exactly what I'm suggesting, my lord. Mm -hmm. So then I asked the policeman, well, would he arrest Ian? He said he hadn't got the power to do that, but he would come back with us and talk to him. Um, as I remember him saying, see how the land lies. So I said, now look, if my sister had just been beaten up by the man next door, would he just come and speak to him? Oh no, he said, no, then I'd arrest him and the man might get ten years for assault and battery. Yes, so when the doctor had finished uh, treating your sister, uh, you accompanied your sister to her home? Yes, we drove in my car and the policeman followed in his panda car. Yes. When we got there, it was the policeman who bravely knocked at the door. Yes, was Mr. Whiting at home? Oh, yes. He'd obviously been in bed. He was in his dressing gown. So he greeted the policeman with open arms. He said he'd been in a terrible state about Jennifer, but she'd just run off, he said. And then when he saw her, he said, thank God you're all right. The policeman was totally taken in. How do you mean, taken in? Well, you don't go to bed if you're in a terrible state of worry, do you? You could see by his hair and his roomy eyes he'd been fast asleep. Uh, did you enter the house? Uh, yes. Well, the policeman went in first and we followed. And Jenny went upstairs to see if the children were all right, and Ian offered the policeman a drink. They seemed to be getting on frightfully well. And then the policeman asked Ian what had happened, and seemed quite satisfied with his lame version. Well, Jenny came downstairs and said that the children were all right, and then Ian made a grab for her, and she screamed. Then the policeman suggested it might be better if Jenny went elsewhere for the night, or well, not that Ian should go. Yes, but in the event, what happened? Well, the magnanimous batterer said that he would go to an hotel. Lord, that was a highly improper remark. Mrs. Stratton, every time you make comments that are prejudiced, <coughs> you weaken your evidence. I'm saying this in case there's any doubt in the jury's minds. Uh, do you understand? I'm sorry if my comments upset Mr. Whiting in any way. Uh, so the accused said he would go to an hotel for the night. Mm, the policeman seemed very impressed with this. Yes, and what time did the accused leave? He packed his bag and went with the policeman. Yes. Did you stay the night with your sister? No, she wanted to be on her own, so I left about two. Yes, you had no worry about leaving her on her own? Well, yes, I did. So before I went home, I went in to see Mrs. Woolgar and I asked her to call me if she heard anything during the night. Yes. And, um, did uh, the accused return that night? Oh, no, he was far too clever for that. He telephoned her every hour on the hour to keep her awake, didn't he? My lord, the witness has just said that she was not in the house during the night, so she cannot know for a fact that the telephone rang every hour on the hour. And Mr Parsons, you just asked your witness if she stayed the night with her sister. She said she did not. Uh, yes, my lord. 
Then you asked her if the accused tried to return that night? Uh, yes, my lord. Well, if the witness was not in the house that night, how would she know? Uh, she couldn't, my lord. Are you deliberately leading your witness into giving hearsay evidence, Mr. Parson? I am very sorry, my lord. Now, uh, Mrs. Stratton, your sister has been married for seven years. Uh, to your knowledge, has anything like this happened before? Well, I've been in the States for the past four years. I've only been back about three months. Well, well during the last three months? Well, yes. The very first time I saw Jenny, I knew that there was something wrong. You say you knew. How can you be so positive? Well, my sister has two children. Ben, who's four, and Jessica, who's two. Well, when I first, first saw Ben, I gave him a present. Um, an engine that blew steam. Well, then I put my arms around him to give him a hug. Now, at first, he went as stiff as a board, and then he started punching. He spat at me, and he kicked, and he scratched. Now, he was expressing himself with violence. He wasn't able to react to a, a warm, loving hug, because violence was all he knew. He also had a speech defect. Or rather, he, he did have, but it has got better since he hasn't seen his father. Yes. And um, uh, how about the little girl, Jessica? Yes, yes, again. The first time that I saw her, I knew she seemed to be in a state of fear whenever her father came into the room. And I remember, whenever he spoke, she rolled her eyes and waved her head. She stopped doing that now. Yes. And do you remember any other incident that you saw or heard uh, between your sister and the accused? Mm. A month ago, Jenny came to visit me. She had a black eye and a swollen face. She said that she'd tripped. Oh, well, of course, I wasn't there, so I don't know how she got the black eye, but I don't think she tripped. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mrs. Stratton. You're really rather a remarkable lady, Mrs. Stratton. Hmm. Would you agree with that assessment of yourself? No more remarkable than yourself, sir. Yes, well, I'm full of admiration. And Mr. Lloyd, is this eulogy to continue, or do you intend to cross-examine the witness? Uh, my lord, uh, Mrs. Stratton, what I'm getting at is this. Within minutes of seeing your sister's children, you are able to sort out what are their maladjusted behavioural problems, do an on-the-spot analysis, and come to the conclusion that Ben was the child of a violent family. Well, children of violence usually come from violent families. The children of... Uh, read that in an American textbook, did you? I might have done. Books aren't all lies, you know. Yes, but you're not a psychiatrist, are you, Mrs Stratton? No, I'm not. And not all books say that all violent children come from violent families, do they? I said, usually. Yes, but some children from violent families go the other way, reject violence, become pacifists. Ben expressed himself with violence because violence was all he knew. You're not a psychiatrist, are you? I have a degree in psychology. And would you say a degree in the study of the natural phenomena of the mind qualifies you for psychiatry, which is the treatment of mental illness or disease? I'm not a psychiatrist. A bit of an amateur one, wouldn't you say? Like to go around poking your nose into other people's business, sorting out their private lives. Now look, I'm not just a stranger who's popped in to cause a bit of trouble between husband and wife. We're talking about my sister, sir. Now she had her nose broken. She can't breathe properly through it. And now she has sinus trouble and the doctors say she'll have that until she dies. She had her fingers broken. So the middle finger and the one next to it were bent right back until they snapped. And she's got no feeling in those fingers. She, she picks things up and then she drops them. Her body was black and blue. She's still got some of the marks. And you tell me. You accuse me. You call that poking your nose in? Well, there comes a point when you have to poke your nose into other people's private lives, sir. 
Aren't you exaggerating the whole thing, Aren't Mrs. you trivialising the whole thing? I think not. You've seen the medical reports. Haven't you twisted the whole thing? No, I haven't. Well, I suggest that you led your sister on. What do you mean, led her on? Well, it was you that called the police. Something had to be done. Your sister didn't think Look, so. Look, she was living in cloud cuckoo land. She thought everything was going to be all right. Yes, and you twisted things in her mind until she thought everything wouldn't be all well, right. She thought that she could help him. She thought somewhere over the rainbow there'd be happiness. Yes, and you told her differently. Too bloody true. Yes, you've done a great deal of harm, and you've caused a great deal of trouble. Well, something had to be done. People like my sister, it, it won't just go away if they pretend it didn't happen. And it won't just go away if we pretend it didn't happen. Look, by our failure, by our failure to deal with this sort of thing, we, us, all of us, are guilty of creating the child neurotics of today, the delinquents of tomorrow, and the adult criminals of the future. And was it with that sort of rhetoric that you persuaded your sister to bring this action in the first place? Oh, she'd lost all her confidence. So you decided to go gunning for her husband? Look, over a year ago, she went to see the social services people. She told them that he was hitting her. I wasn't even here then. She has tried to get out of it on her own. Ah. What did the social services people say? I'm sorry, my lord. My sister told me this. That makes it hearsay, doesn't it? It's all right, Mrs. Stratton. If the defence asks the question in cross-examination, then it is admissible. They sent a social worker around to see Ian. And did your sister tell you what happened at that interview? Well, apparently she was fooled, just like the policeman. She thought Ian was a charming man. She said she couldn't believe that such an educated man would attack his wife. She said there were two sides to every problem, that sort of thing, and went away telling my sister to try and patch things up. So, we've got doctors, we've got policemen, we've got social workers, all saying the same thing, haven't we, Mrs Stratton? I mean, an outsider can never really know what goes on between two people within a marriage, can he? As the professional experts say, there are many sides to any issue that comes out of a marriage. Now, wouldn't you agree? The experts are so busy seeing both sides to the problem, they're in danger of falling down a hole in the middle. Now, wife battering is one of the most neglected areas. And I believe the authorities are frightened of the problem. Oh, come on now. What do you mean, frightened? I said frightened. And don't patronise me, sir. You may wear a wig and a gown, but you seem to know very little about life outside of the law. What are the authorities frightened of, Mrs. Stratton? Bringing down the structure of society. More hyperbole, Mrs. Stratton. I mean, that isn't to be taken literally, is it? The family is one of the great civilizers of mankind, so they say. Now, the man used to go out hunting. Now he goes out to work. He gives unselfishly to his family, so they say. I smash a few bricks in that wall and they're frightened that the whole house will come tumbling down. What do you suggest the authorities do, Mrs. Stratton? Ah, uh, my lord, might I ask where this is leading? Um, what bearing does this line of questioning have on the case, Mr. Lloyd? My well, lord, I believe that Mrs. Stratton's views played a large part in this action being brought at all. And therefore, I believe that those views are relevant. I see, but I think you're treading a very tenuous line, Mr. Lloyd. My lord. What do you suggest the authorities do, Mrs. Stratton? Well, I believe, first of all, straight away, they should open, in every town, 24 hours a day, a family crisis centre. And this should be publicised so that people know where to go for help. But for the future, for our children, I believe there should be lessons in school on family life. And not just sex lessons, but lessons on the law of family life. Yes, we have done away with the law that allows a husband to beat and lock his wife up, you know. Well, he can still beat her up if there's no one looking. And he can still rape her with the full sanction of the law. Oh, my lord. Yes, come to your point, Mr Lloyd. Yes, my lord, I have tried to demonstrate that Mrs Stratton is involved in a cause. I think that she saw a few quarrels at her sister's house and she thought to herself, this looks good. This is a cause that I can really get my teeth into. You bloody fool. Mrs Stratton, I have given you a great deal of latitude, but I will not allow such contempt of the law. I didn't mean contempt, my lord. 
Do you think that calling Learned Counsel a bloody fool is anything else? He's wrong, that's all. I'm not trying to use my sister's problems to spout a cause. All right, all right, I care about any woman who might be in the same mess, but we're talking about Jenny, my sister and her children. This violence is, is damaging to all of them. And will the vicious circle go on? Will Ben grow up and batter his own wife? Will he make his children suffer? Will Jessica grow up unable to have a proper relationship with a man because violence is all she knows? Well, yes. Yes, I did all I could to persuade my sister to come to court today. Maybe too late for her, it's already happened, but at least it's out in the open. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Mrs. Stratton. Whilst in America, you formed an anti-rape organisation. Yes, I helped form an organisation that helped rape victims, yes. And there were times when you protected wives from their husbands, didn't you? Yes. Went into the family home and took the wife away because her husband wanted to make love to her. If she was desperate enough to call us, I term that rape. Well, it seems to me that you're attacking a man's rights, Mrs Stratton. Look, a marriage licence doesn't buy you a slave. A man has no rights over his wife without her consent. I suggest that your life is a constant battle against men. Oh, that's ridiculous. That you see men as a constant threat to women. Well, the sort who batters his wife, yes. And this hatred of men has motivated you to use all your powers of persuasion on your sister to bring this totally false allegation of battering. Look, I'm a married woman. Yes. But do you like your husband, Mrs Stratton? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, no further questions. Uh, Mrs. Stratton, you, you've already said you are married. How long have you been married? Thirteen years. And how many children do you have? I have three children. Do you see a lot of your husband? Well, we lecture at the same college. Well, of course, he's full-time. I only, I only do a couple of days a week yes. because your of family. I'm oh, sorry. Your husband's American, I yes, believe? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Whose idea was it to come to England? It was mine. I was homesick. He didn't want to come at first. Yes. Uh, well, what made him change his mind? We didn't want to split up the family. Yes, so your husband is very fond of you. We love each other. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Stratton. No further questions, my lord. Thank you, Mrs. Stratton. Um, uh, my lord. Uh, yes? Um, it is uh, 4.37, my lord, which means we probably missed the fast train to London. Oh, dear, I'm sorry. You'd better telephone your wife, Mr. Parsons. Tell her you'll be late. Save a row tonight, won't you? Thank you, my lord. We'll Lord. start promptly at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, uh, yes, that's it to uh, the morning, uh, Mrs. Whiting. It's a ten o'clock start. This judge is a stickler for time. It is in the mornings. Uh, so it won't be too long to wait. You'll be on second. I don't want to go through with it. It won't be so bad. No, I don't want to give evidence. I want to stop the trial. Well, that's up to you. Uh, have a word with your solicitor. Please, can't I just drop the charges? Well, yes, that is your decision. Maybe you'd like to talk to your sister about it and uh, let me know what you decide in the morning. Excuse me, Mrs. Whiting. The cases in Fulchester Crown Court are fictitious, but the jury is made up of members of the general public. Join us tomorrow for the second part of this case. Jennifer Whiting claims she was beaten and battered by her husband, but yesterday she told her counsel she wasn't sure whether she wanted to continue with the case. Mrs Whiting has arrived at the Fulchester Crown Court, but whether she will actually give evidence against her husband is still in doubt. Now, Mrs Bulgar, will you just tell the court 
What happened on the night of October the 7th last year? When my husband was away. He was abroad, on business, in fact. I was alone in the house, uh, listening to some music. Marla's fifth, in actual fact. It was just after nine when I heard shouting and screaming. I, I turned the record down and listened. It was coming from the Whiting's direction. What sort of house do you live in, Mrs. Woolgar? Uh, detached. And where is the Whiting's house in relation to yours? Well, if you go out of my front door, it's to the left, next door. Yes, and how far from your house? Uh, with the garden separating about uh, 30 feet. Yes, so you heard these noises coming from the Whiting's house. What did you do? Uh, well, uh, I'm afraid I turned the gramophone up quite loud. I, I'm afraid I tried to block the noise out. I'd, I'd heard it all before. How do you mean? Well, in the last couple of years, there have been several rows. Yes, so you've heard these uh, screams and shouts coming from the Whiting's house on other occasions. Uh, worse than that. Can you explain that for us? But it was last summer, late at night. Uh, Mrs. Whiting was crawling about the garden in her nightie, making terrible howling noises. Yes, did you find out what was going on? Uh, well, no, it, it didn't seem the thing to do, and my husband said we shouldn't interfere. Uh, but on this occasion in October, she knocked on my door, so I had no choice. Yes, and how did you feel about that? I'm afraid I hoped she'd go away. Yes, you hoped the, uh, the social leper would crawl back. I didn't want to get involved. Yes, I think we understand that, Mrs. Wooga. What made you change your mind? Well, I went into the hall and I heard this sobbing. I opened the door and I saw Mrs. Whiting smothered in blood. Her, her clothes were all torn and her skin was, it was a, a livid red in, in some places with, with black, black bruises, as though her poor body had been used as some kind of punch bag. Her hair was soaking wet and, and covered with dirt and, and she'd been knocking on my door for five minutes. Knocking without getting any answer. Yes. Now, I so call myself a Christian. My only defence, my only excuse is that I thought one should not interfere between man and wife. I thought the home was the one place that was private, inviolate. I was wrong. I just thank God that Mrs. Whiting is alive. If she had died, her death would have been on my conscience for the rest of my days on this earth. Yes. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Woodgall. <clears throat> Mrs. Whiting arrived on your doorstep in a terrible state. Yes. Such a state that you thought she might die. When I saw all the marks and bruises. But you didn't call 999, did you, Mrs. Woolgar? No. You didn't even call a doctor, did you? No, I didn't. You have a woman on your doorstep, covered in blood, you think she's dying, and you don't call a doctor? Well, Mrs. Whiting wouldn't let me call one. But if she was in such a terrible state, how could she make that decision? Well, she wasn't in such a terrible state. That was my first impression. Ah, so your first impression was wrong. Well, I bathed her face and found the blood was all coming from the nose. So she wasn't at death's door? Well, she was covered in marks and bruises. How do you mean covered? Do you mean every inch of her was covered? Oh, no, no, no. There were patches on her arms here and so there. So she wasn't covered in marks and bruises, but there were patches. Now, Mrs. Mulgar, are you aware that some women only have to be touched to come up in a terrible bruise mark? It's something to do with the blood, isn't yes, it? Yes, and are you aware that Mrs. Whiting has that sort of condition? No, no, I was not aware of that. So Mrs. Whiting arrived on your doorstep with a simple fracture of the nose and a couple of broken fingers. But apart from that, she was all right. Well, yes. Now, did Mrs. Whiting... But I would Whiting... hardly call that all right. Yes. Now, did Mrs. Whiting tell you what had happened? She said she'd had a row with her husband. You're quite sure of that? Quite sure of what? That she said, I've had a row with my husband. Yes, quite sure. She did not say, my husband has been beating me up. No, she didn't. But a moment later, she said she'd run into the garden and, and fallen over. That wasn't true either, was it? But Mrs. Whiting, not to say to you, any time... Mrs. Whiting, you can't come in. I want to see my solicitor. Well, I'll see him, but you must not come into the court. Now, what happened after you bathed 
Mrs. Whiting's face. Well, as she asked to use the phone, she called her sister. She called her sister. And 15 minutes later, Mrs. Stratton arrived. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. I want to stop the trial. She said, he's battered you. And this time, you are not keeping it quiet. I see. So, Mrs. Stratton actually told her sister what had happened. Yes, that's right. Now, Mrs. Bulgar, did you on this occasion, or have you in the past, observed Mr. Whiting strike his wife? Well, I've heard the shouting and screaming. Yes, but on those occasions, were you able to observe who was doing the hitting? If, indeed, hitting was involved. But it was going on behind closed doors. How could anyone know what was happening? Thank you, Mrs. Bulgar. No further questions. Uh, does your Lord, do you have any questions? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Parsons. You may leave the witness box, Mrs. Woolgar. Uh, may I stay in court, my lord? I'm afraid you must. You may sit over there. Oh. My lord, I'd like to call Mrs. Jennifer Whiting. You are Mrs. Jennifer Whiting, and you live at the Squirrels Orchard Road, Fulchester West. The Squirrels is my home, my family home. I'm staying with my sister now. Yes. Now, Mrs. Whiting, would you just tell the court what happened? on the night of October the 7th last year. I was at home, waiting for my husband to come back. It was Ben's birthday. My son, he was four years old that day, and Ian had said that he would be back early, at five. He didn't come. Ben cried. I put him to bed at seven. Yes, uh, your husband still hadn't arrived home? No, he still hadn't come by 8.30. I started to worry. I thought he might be at the club. Yes, what club is that, Mrs. Whiting? It's the golf club. Ian uses it for business. I mean, he'll take business colleagues there. I thought he might be there. Yes, was he there? Yes, he was. He sounded jolly. Yes. How did he react to you phoning him at his club? All right. Yes. Did you tell him about your son's birthday? Yes, I asked him if he'd bought Ben a present. He didn't know what I was talking about. He'd forgotten. He said I should have phoned him at the office, reminded him. Yes. Did he say anything else? Yes, he said, I suppose I shall have to come home. I told him he could stay there because Ben was in bed. I told him he'd cried himself to sleep. Ian started shouting about emotional blackmail. He put the phone down. Yes. At what time did your husband eventually arrive home? Just after nine. Yes. And then what took place? He... Well, um... Um... I'm not sure. We well, remember what took place. No, I'm not sure. Mrs. Whiting, are you telling the court that you cannot remember what happened when your husband returned home? No. Then what are you saying? Yes. I, I'm not sure. I can't remember. Uh, my Lord, I would like a short adjournment in order to take instructions in this matter. Well, Mr. Parsons, it appears that you're you... You see, he didn't mean to. He, he didn't mean to hurt me. He didn't mean to be so cruel. Well, he's never touched the children. He needs help. He, he told me it would never happen again. Well, when did Mr. Whiting make this promise? Uh, y yesterday in the park. I met him when I took the children out. He didn't mean to attack me. He didn't mean uh, to attack I didn't attack her. I simply said that we were both to blame and that we should try and make a go of it. Uh, now, now, Mr. Whiting, don't shout from the dock. You'll have your turn later. Uh, my lord, my client was in fact anticipating his defence, which is that the act was not deliberate, but accidental. Is that what he's saying? Is that what you're saying? I, I was holding her off. It, it was an accident. She was attacking me. Now, this is quite enough. Mrs. Whiting, you will not address the accused again. And Mr. Whiting, you will remain silent until it's your turn to give evidence. You see, it isn't true. What isn't true, Mrs. Whiting? The promises he made. And, um, uh, you're still saying that, uh, you can't remember what took place? You're not sure? We met in the park. Ian said that he was sorry and played with Ben. 
he said that we should both try to make a go of it for the sake of the children. And he started to cry. He, he didn't threaten me at all. He said I could go ahead with the case, but that he wanted me back no matter what. Yes. Now, Mrs. Whiting, just tell the court what happened that night when your husband came back from the club. Uh, my lord, the witness has already said that she does not know what happened. Mrs. Whiting, you said that you weren't sure when you were last asked the question. Well, I meant that I wasn't sure whether I wanted to go through with this. He said that he was sorry, truly sorry. But he isn't. Very well. Now tell us what happened. He came home. He was quite drunk. Not staggering, you understand. He holds his liquor very well. He's had a great deal of practice. Before the children, I tried to keep up with him. He, he sat in a chair. I was watching television. He asked me what right I had to drag him home from the club. He said he wanted to have a party. He asked me to get Ben up. I told him not to be silly. He sat there staring at me for what seemed like hours. It must have been, I don't know, five minutes. Then he got up and came over to me and leant over me with his face close to mine and he said, would you like a kiss, my love? Then he stood up and hit me with his fist full in the face. Then he took hold of my ankles and dragged me off the sofa and out into the hall and he tried to drag me up the stairs. He kept shouting that he was going to throw me from the banisters. Then he let go of my ankles. I dragged myself away from him. He said that he was going back to the club. He started to move to the door, then turned and came back. He took hold of my hand. He said he was going to give me the water treatment. I screamed. He slapped me on the face and he bent my fingers back until they snapped. Then he dragged me up the stairs and into the bathroom. He filled the sink with water. Then he took hold of me very gently and rocked me in his arms and said that he was sorry. I started to cry. He said he didn't like to see me cry and he didn't like to see all that blood. It was then that he gave me the water treatment. Yes, what is that? The water treatment. Now, Mrs. Whiting, just tell the court what the water treatment is. He took hold of my neck and pushed my head into the water so that I couldn't breathe. And when I choked in the water, he let me go. I coughed and I was sick over the bathroom floor. Then he pushed my head in again. There was a great booming noise and everything went black. Does that, uh, does that mean you fainted, Mrs. Whiting? When I came to, I was lying on the floor of the bathroom. I dragged myself into the children's room. Ben saw me and screamed. I saw someone coming up the stairs. It was Ian. He came in and told me to get up. He dragged me up and punched me with his fist in the face. I catapulted back against Ben's bunk bed. Ben screamed hysterically and I fell down. Then Ian took me by the hand this hand with the fingers broken and he dragged me down the stairs and out to the back door. He pushed me out. He locked the door behind me. I lay there for... I couldn't move. I wanted to go to sleep with the children. I thought, I must try or I will die. I crawled over to Mrs. Woolgar's house. 
despite the shame. There was nothing else that I could do. Yes, I remember what happened that night. Mrs. Whiting, your injuries were sustained whilst your husband was trying to disengage himself from your attack. Isn't that the truth? No. You attacked him with a knife and he had to protect himself. In the struggle, your middle and ring finger of your right hand were broken and it was his elbow that made contact with your nose. With what knife? Your husband then took you upstairs and tried to bathe your face. But you became hysterical and tried to drown yourself in the basin of water. No, I didn't. Well, I suggest you did. And I further suggest that you provoked your husband into handling you roughly. That's not true. Now, your husband has had a successful career, hasn't he, Mrs Whiting? Yes. Yes, four years ago, he joined Lodge and Carter, an accountancy firm. Two years later, he's taken on as a junior partner. Today, he is an equal partner in that firm, now being called Lodge and Whiting. That's true. Your husband has to work long hours. Yes. Sometimes he has to go away. Sometimes. Sometimes abroad. Yes, sometimes. And you became jealous, didn't you? No, that's not true. Isn't it true that you thought your husband was no longer attracted to you? No. Oh, Mrs Whiting, since your second child, what has the sexual side of your marriage been like? It's been all right. Now, you have stretch marks on your body, don't you? Yes. Are you ashamed of those stretch marks? They sometimes happen when you have children. Yes, and is it true, since your second child, you haven't undressed in front of your husband? I don't... Speak up, please, Mrs Whiting. I don't like to. Because you felt insecure. You thought your husband would go looking for a younger girl without stretch marks scarring her body. So you nagged him, and you nagged him, until you provoked your husband. Then you would go at him with your fists or anything you had to hand. My husband started beating me nearly three years ago. I was pregnant with Jessica at the time. He told me I hadn't ironed his shirt properly and he kicked me in the stomach. When I turned to protect my unborn baby, he kicked me in the spine. I've had trouble with my back ever since. He kicked you in the stomach whilst you were pregnant. He damaged your spine. Yes. Well, if what you're saying is true, why on earth didn't you leave him? I was ashamed to. Ashamed of your possessive jealousy. I don't think that you could understand. Well, I think that the court does, Mrs Whiting. He stopped my friends visiting. I was at home with the children. And then the physical violence. I lost my confidence, my self-respect. Well, then, I'll ask you again. Why didn't you leave him? Where could I go? He had his career, I had the children. Well, your parents live less than 50 miles away. You could have gone there left the children with your mother, resumed your teaching career. No, I couldn't go to my parents. I couldn't tell them. Because you were ashamed? Yes. Well, if you're telling us the truth today, you had nothing to be ashamed of. It's the social stigma of being a battered wife. It's having to admit to your parents that you're a failure. My father didn't come to our wedding because he didn't like Ian. Yes, you didn't get on with your father, did you? No. Very much the authoritarian, wasn't he? Yes. Victorian in attitudes. Yes. He liked your three brothers better than he liked you, didn't he? Yes. And you felt rejected, didn't you? I loved him in spite of everything. Yes, but he didn't love you, did he? And I suggest that you felt deprived and rejected as a child. And at the unconscious level, at least, you lack the ability to trust in the love of a man. And that is why you made your husband's life a living hell. And that is why you stayed with him. You needed him, but you couldn't trust him, could you? I stayed because I felt guilty. Guilty because it was you causing the trouble. And that is why you've brought this evil charge against an innocent man. Because you want to punish him. Well, you have punished him for three years. Isn't that enough? I haven't punished him. No further questions, my lord. Uh, this is fighting. Uh, did you seek any advice, professional advice, for your marital problems? Yes, I went once to the marriage guidance. 
that the man who saw me needed guidance himself. Yeah, but uh, was there another occasion that you sought help? Yes. It was after Ian had poured boiling water on my breasts. I went to the social services. I told them that I was leaving my husband. I had the children with me. They told me to go back to Ian. They said a woman who leaves home of her own will makes herself homeless and therefore isn't entitled to assistance. The young woman said it wasn't their policy to interfere with the sanctity of marriage. Yes, and what happened? They sent a social worker round to see Ian. And? He was charming. The social worker didn't believe me. She said it's only the inarticulate man who beats his wife. It's a form of inarticulate lovemaking, she said. After she'd gone, Ian smashed the coal tongs on my foot. I went back. This time they were more sympathetic. Yes. Now, Mr. Whiting, uh, a moment ago you said, in evidence to my learned friend, that your husband's been beating you for about three years now. In that case, will you tell the court again uh, why it is that you've stayed with him for so long? Well, if I'd gone, if I'd found somewhere to live, I might still have lost custody of the children. So I stayed and stayed in the hope that things might get better. And I convinced myself that I was doing it for the children's sake, because when he's calm, Ian is a good father. But I soon realised that things wouldn't work out. Both the children were disturbed. I began to worry about them, not because of Ian, but because of myself. I began to resent them, because without them I could have left and started again. It was their fault that I was in this mess. And besides, I'd read about battered wives who turned on their children. My moral reasons for staying had gone. So there must have been other reasons for your staying. What were they? It takes a long time to get to know another human being. And when he's calm, he's so kind, so gentle. There were good moments. He has a lot of acquaintances, but no real friends. He needed me. And I thought that if I left, I might not be able to form another relationship. We needed each other. I was the only one who saw him frightened at night. Frightened? What was he frightened of, uh, Mrs. Whiting? A nightmare. Can you tell us about that? Yes, he'd had the same one several times. It was very vivid, he said. A dream with colours. Mm. He was lying in a clearing in the woods, asleep. There was no sound except for the trees rustling. And suddenly something was pressing down on him. He couldn't turn his head to see who or what it was, but he could sense that it was something evil. He had no voice, no strength. And this thing was pressing down on him. He'd wake up shivering and drenched with sweat. When the beating started, I thought that I could help him, that it would pass. To think anything else seemed to me to admit defeat with the only person I knew in the world, really knew. Without him, I could see no point in life, except for the children. Is there? The cases in Fulchester Crown Court are fictitious, but the jury is made up of members of the general public. Join us tomorrow for the final part of this case. Whiting has been accused of battering his wife. Today the defence start their case and Ian Whiting will have the chance of putting his version of what happened that night. Thank you. Uh, now, Mr Whiting, will you tell us what happened on the evening of October the 7th? Yes. Uh, we had been going over the accounts and VAT of a large construction company. Later in the afternoon, two of the directors of the firm came in and after my partner and I had been over the figures with them, we went to the club. And at the club, did you receive a telephone call from your wife? Yes, I did. What did she say? 
Well, she started to become turgid and accused me of being with another woman. And did you then start to shout and accuse her of emotional blackmail? Uh, no. Well, the two directors and my partner were right by my side, you see. No, I offered to get Kenneth, my partner, to speak to her, but she said that was no good, as he was always covering for me, and if I didn't come straight home, she didn't know what she might do. That's when I accused her of emotional blackmail. Had you drunk a great deal? Well, no more than my companions, uh, three or four scotches. Mm, uh, that amount might affect some people. True, but uh, neither my companions nor myself were in the least bit inebriated. Now, how soon after your wife phoned did you return home? Uh, straight away. Why? Because I was worried as to what she might do to the children or to herself. And what happened when you got back? She flew into an infantile rage. These jealous rages had been getting worse. How did you react? Well, I didn't. I just sat down and let the storm rage around my head. And what effect did this have on your wife? Well, it made her furious, of course, saying that she despised me for not owning up. But there was something that made you react a few minutes later. Uh, yes. There was a fight between no, you no, and your no, wife. No, sorry, not a fight. No, well, as I just said, these rages had been getting worse. Uh, this time she attacked me with a knife. That there was a struggle in which she held on to the knife like grim death. I had to use all my force to prise it out of her hand. Yes, and that, that was how your wife's middle and ring finger on her right hand were broken. That's quite correct. You see, as I was pulling the knife away, her head came down and my elbow went up like that, you see, and her nose met the full force. Uh, well, naturally, she was stunned and blood began to pour from her nose, so I helped her up the stairs, sat her on the side of the bath and began to bathe her nose. By this time, blood was pouring quite freely, so I held her head over the basin. Uh, then she came to and started to scream and put her whole head into the basin as if she wanted to drown herself, so I naturally pulled her away, but uh, she broke away, ran downstairs screaming, and I washed out to the basin. Why didn't you follow your wife? Well, because I thought it would do more harm than good. Then I heard the front door bang. Did you go after your wife then? No, no, I allowed her to get some fresh air for a few minutes, but I went to look for her later on and she'd gone. So I just sat down and waited and hoped that she might come back. Now, going back to this jealousy that yes. your wife felt, was there any justification for it? Yes, well, you see, I really ought to be quite honest about this. After Jennifer had had our first child, she started to act strangely, transferring all her affections onto him. Well, I thought this was all right at first, but it went on for nearly a year. I then met another woman, and eventually I told Jennifer that I was having an affair, but not just a casual one, that I was in fact in love. She threatened to kill herself if I left home. So naturally I broke off the affair and have been totally faithful ever since. But you see, what <laughs> makes being here so painful and dreadful is the fact that Jennifer and I are fairly rational people. I mean, we, we are able to discuss things. But sadly, we cannot exist together without something in me sparking off violence in her, such as this totally irrational charge of assault. Yes, thank you. No further questions. Yes. Very smooth, uh, Mr. Whiting. Very bland, very convincing. The policeman believed you, the uh, social worker believed you. You might even get this jury to believe you. Well, I have told the truth. Have you? Are you sure? Yes, I'm quite sure. Yes, well, it's just as well you made a few slips along the way. I, I might have started believing you myself. Uh, the Lord, if the learned friend has any evidence against my client, please let him state it. Yeah, Mr. Parsons, you're supposed to be cross-examining the witness, not baiting him. My Lord. Mr. Whiting, uh, you're at your club. Your wife phones. Did you accuse her of emotional blackmail? No, you tell my learned friend your friends were standing by the phone. Uh, the next minute, your wife says she won't be responsible for her actions unless you return. You accuse her of emotional blackmail. Now, had your friends moved away? No, but my wife said that I shouted and screamed at the words. Actually, I spoke them quite quietly and in a different context. Oh. Not only your wife and you were witness to what happened in your house at nine o'clock on that October night, am I right? That's quite correct. Your word against hers? Yes. And that's what you're depending on, isn't it, sir? You see, uh, you say that when you arrived home, you let the storm rage about your head. That's right. Well, uh, Mrs. Woolgar said that she'd heard screams and shouts emanating from your house on other occasions. Is she wrong? Well, I'm no saint. No. 
Sometimes you stood up for yourself. Yes, I did. Sometimes perhaps you started a row. No, 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 I didn't. Yeah. So I got the impression this time, the time that your wife attacked you with a knife, was the first time that you had defended yourself. Have I got that wrong? Well, I mean, we have had rows, but only words. But this time, uh, your wife attacked you. Yes, that's right. Yes. Now, uh, Mr. Whiting, you're a fit, well-built man. I would say that you could defend yourself against your wife quite easily. But you see, Mr. Whiting, you broke your wife's nose, you broke her fingers, her body was badly bruised. I put it to you that you battered your wife. No, I did not. How did her clothes come to be torn? But in the struggle. Yes, and you let her go out, half naked, stunned and bleeding. I allowed her to calm down, but after ten minutes I did go to look for her. Mm. Which, did you, which did you do first? Uh, go to look for her or get ready for bed? Well, I went to look for her. Yes, well, we were desperately worried. Yes, I was. Yes. And how far did you look, Mr. Whiting? I mean, she was only next door. Yes, but I couldn't leave the house, you see, because of the children. Uh, yes, yes. So you got ready for bed? Well, 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 not straight away, no. Oh, you got ready for bed later? Yes. Well, much, much later. Yes, yes. yes. Because you were desperately worried? Yes, I was. Yes, yes, yes. Did you ring the police? No, I didn't. Yeah. Why not? Well, because I was expecting my wife to come back and I was giving her time to do so. Ah, yes, I see. Now, when uh, did you get ready for bed? How do you mean? Well, I mean, it's a simple enough question. I mean, when did you take your clothes off and put Oh, I see. No, <laughs> about midnight. Yes. And what time had your wife gone out? Uh, just after nine o'clock. Had you phoned the police by midnight? No. Had you phoned the police at any time? No. No. And what time did the policeman knock on your door? Around one o'clock in the morning. Yes, yes. So, Mr. Whiting, your, your wife uh, was out half naked uh, and some four hours later uh, you are lying on your bed. Uh, actually, sitting in a chair. Well, uh, what point are you trying to make, Mr. Whiting? How do you mean? Well, I mean, I said you were lying in bed. You said you were sitting in a chair. Uh, what point are you making? Well, the point being that I wasn't in bed. Oh, I see. Uh, sitting in a chair makes it all right. That means it's correct. That puts you in the right, does it? The point being, I wasn't in bed. Now, October the 7th, any idea what the temperature was? <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't remember. Well, I hope you had antifreeze in your radiator. There was a severe frost that night, wasn't there? Was there? You can't remember? No, I can't remember. Well, your wife was out in it, Mr. Whiting. She was out in it until nearly 1 a.m., as far as you knew. Half naked. She was dying of exposure in it, as far as you knew. But I couldn't leave the house. But you could have phoned the police. Well, I didn't really want them involved. And when the police did arrive, you agreed to go to an hotel for the night. Your wife was so upset. Yes. Yes, and you went to the Grand Hotel. That's quite correct. Did you phone your wife that night? <coughs> no, I didn't. And did you phone your wife from 2 a.m. until 9 a.m. every hour on the hour? No, I didn't. And when your wife picked up the telephone, did you put down your receiver? No, I did not. Your wife says you did. Well, I'm sorry, she's mistaken. Yes. Well, uh, Mr. Whiting, I have here a copy of your bill from the Grand Hotel. Uh, do, uh, do you see what I'm getting at? I mean, would you like to make your excuses now before I read out the items? Yes, well, I did bill? phone several people that night. Oh, you were making phone calls throughout the night? Yes, I couldn't sleep. Ah, I see. Well, if you'd like to give me the names. Well, well, I can't remember. You can't remember? No. Well, well what name? No, I'm sorry, I can't remember. Ah, yes. you, you said you couldn't sleep? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Well, yes, your wife has told us that you had bad nights. In fact, that you had nightmares. Yes, but once in a while. Yes, but always the same one. Uh, this lying in a wood with someone on top of you, you weren't able to do anything. <laughs> yes. I did phone my wife that night, ah. but, but uh, on the hour and every hour, but not to keep her awake, just to make sure that she was doing nothing silly. The reason I didn't tell the truth was I was afraid that she might lose custody of the children if the court realised just how unstable she is. I see, yes. Now, um, you are uh, an ambitious sort of chap, aren't you, yes. Mr. Whiting? Yes, yes, I am. You've done very well. Early 30s, you're in partnership. You've worked hard for that, haven't you? Well, it was worth working for. Yes, you work long hours. Yes, I do. You travel a lot. Yes. Take a lot of responsibility on your shoulders. Yes. Do you find it a strain? Well, we're all under strain. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, how many tranquilizers do you take a day? Well, sometimes I don't take any at all. Yes, and on the other days? 
one or two, yes. And uh, you've been to hospital for barrier meal tests for a stomach ulcer. That's quite correct. Yes, did you have a stomach ulcer? Yes, I did. Yes, so, in fact, you have been under a great deal of pressure. Yes, well, I worked very hard. Yes. Now, Mr. Whiting, tell us uh, about uh, your father. My father? I don't understand. Well, I, I'd like you to tell us about your relationship with your father. But I thought you were asking me about my job. Yes, well, now I'm asking you about your father. But I don't see the point. Well, just tell us about your father. Well, he was a civil servant. Yes, yes. Um, well, I mean, he, we didn't have very much in common. He was yes. over 40 when I was born. Yes, you loved your mother. Y yes, I did. Yes. Uh, my Lord, my instructing solicitor has been in touch with the accused mother within the past 24 hours. She doesn't wish to appear in court. She made no comment on this case. and merely spoke of the accused childhood. Thank you, Mr. Persons. Uh, you see, Mr. Whitting, I'm not uh, trying to set a trap for you, but is it not true that your father often beat your mother? Yes. Yes. And there was an occasion when you were five, you tried to defend your mother against your father. Do you remember that? Not very clearly, but yes. I do remember something. Yes. Do you remember what your father did to you? Pushed me aside, I suppose. Yes. Uh, your father was... You don't remember anything else? There wasn't much more to remember. Your father was, was beating your mother. You went to her aid. Your father pushed you aside onto the bed and took a pillow and put it over your head. Your mother says you were half suffocated. But I don't see the connection. Well, I mean, it explains this dream of yours, doesn't it? Being in the wood with someone on top of you, unable to do anything, but, but, to say anything. But surely that's quite a common dream. Oh, well, a boy who sees violence, a boy who is in the wrong end of violence, is likely to grow into the sort of man who will use the same outlet when under uh, business or emotional pressures. Now, you couldn't uh, beat up your business associates, so you took it out on your wife, didn't you? My wife attacked me with a knife. You were brought up in a pattern of violence, and I suggest to you that this same brand of domestic violence has recurred. You battered your wife, didn't you? No, I did not. That, that, that's very clever, very neat. Patterns of violence, dreams, sins of the father. Yes, I grew up in violence. I detest violence. I was determined the same thing would never happen. I went out of my way not to quarrel with Jennifer. I didn't mean to harm her, but I had to get the knife out of her hand. Mm. No further questions, my lord? So Mrs Whiting was a bit hysterical and you suggested that she stayed with her sister. Why? Because she was in danger? No, sir. I thought for her own peace of mind. So, as far as you were concerned, there was no danger to Mrs. Whiting from her husband? That's correct. But Mr. Whiting saw the point. He realised his wife was in a bit of a state and wanted to be near the children. He offered to go to a hotel for the remainder of the night. Yes, so it wasn't your impression then that Mr. Whiting was aggressive through drink? No, sir. Had he in fact been drinking? He showed no signs of being under the influence. Now, the following morning, you submitted your report to your sergeant. I did. Yes, and it was decided to take no action against Mr Whiting. That's correct. Why was that, Constable? Well, sir, without independent evidence, it's very difficult. And there is a duty to the public purse. You see, in a man and wife squabble, when someone gets hurt, it's hard to know just who's at fault. Yes, thank you, Constable. Constable, uh, after this squabble, Mrs. Whiting was a bit hysterical, you said. Yes. Well, Mrs. Whiting had her nose broken, her fingers broken, her body was badly bruised. Uh, what sort of state did you expect her to be in? When you uh, were called, you arrived at the hospital. Now, after you had been called, what delayed you? I was investigating a burglary, sir. Yes. And when you were asked to accompany Mrs. Whiting to her home, did you uh, pull her face and look at your watch? I may have looked at my watch. Yes. Is it not true, Constable, that the police don't really like getting involved in domestics? Well, sir, domestics are very difficult to handle. I mean, you stop the man from hitting the woman, and she grabs you and tries to pull you off her man. The first domestic I ever went to, I had a bottle smashed over my head by the woman. I had to have stitches. Well, isn't it true that the police sometimes avoid going to a domestic until they think it's all over? Not to my knowledge, sir. Then they make sure that no one's actually dead and go off again. If there's an independent witness, we take action. Yes. I mean, no doubt you started off with, uh, with some sympathy for these battered women, Constable. I still have. So, despite your stitches, your attitude hasn't hardened towards them? You only harden towards a situation, sir. 
So, I mean, if you see a, a woman in a punch-up, it's easier for you to see her as some hysterical female, because it would be pretty unbearable to see her as some helpless creature who's asking for help if you're not willing to give that help. If there is a danger to life, we do take action. Yes. Well, I have before me here, Constable, the report from the Select Committee on Violence in Marriage. Have you read this report, Constable? No, sir, I haven't. Well, I recommend it to you, and I'd like to quote to you from it. Uh, and Mrs. X gave oral evidence anonymously on the 12th of March, 1974. She was beaten frequently over a period of 16 years before she left her husband. In her own words, I have had 10 stitches, 3 stitches, 5 stitches, 7 stitches where he has cut me. I have had a knife stuck through my stomach. I have had a poker put through my face. I have no teeth where he had knocked them all out. I have been to the police, and they held him in the nick over the weekend, and he came out on Monday. He was bound over to keep the peace. That was all. On the Tuesday, he gave me the hiding of my life. Which leads me to the question, Constable, is a marriage license a license for domestic violence? Well, action was taken in that particular case, sir. Well, yes, I kept in the nick over the weekend, uh, bound over to keep the peace, no charges made. You call that action, Constable? Constable no. Berriclough is not responsible for taking that sort of decision, Mr. Parsons. Uh, no, my lord, I just wanted to make the point that the police's failure to make any uh, charges against Mr. Whiting is hardly relevant. Well, I think the jury will see that. Constable, would you agree with me that in these sort of cases the law is very difficult to apply? I would say, my lord, that domestic disturbances are awkward to handle and responsibility hard to prove. Thank you. Yes, no further questions, my lord. How long have you known the accused, Mr. Lodge? Since he joined my firm four years ago. And how did he come to be employed by you? I chose him out of 50 applicants. You see, I was hoping to groom someone to take over from me. And how did that plan work out? It worked perfectly. After two years, I took him on as my junior partner. And I now regard him as my own son. Was he under a strain? No, not at all. Took the job in his stride. And what sort of temperament does he have? Well, he's not soft, not in business. Socially, he's a charming man. One of the old school. One of the old school? We still give up our seat to a lady, open doors for them, that sort of thing. Yes, I see. Now, do you know Mrs. Whiting? Yes, I do. And what is your opinion of Mrs. Whiting? Well, I don't wish to be ungallant, but uh, she doesn't make very much of an effort. She hasn't got anything to say for herself. You know what I mean? No, uh, no social ease. Nervous, neurotic woman. Bloody nuisance to a man like Ian going up in the world. But this didn't stop you from making him your partner? Oh, no. But I warned him to keep his business and his home life totally apart. Now, then it was that he confided in me and told me frankly that his wife was obsessively jealous about him and that it was making her ill. Mm. Did you see this jealousy for yourself? Oh, yes. She phoned up the office on several occasions. I remember um, last September she rang up. Ian was in Amsterdam. Well, the woman became hysterical. I told her to pull herself together. Ian was there on business, but... There was no reasoning with a woman. I put the phone down. If Ian hadn't been an exceptional sort of fellow, he would never have put up with it. But he's stuck by her, and this is the thanks he gets. I'm convinced he would never have hit her. Thank you, Mr. Lodge. Ah, Mr. Lodge, how can you be so convinced that the accused did not batter his wife? I know the man. Do you know the wife? I've already said. Well, how often have you met her? Once, at a dinner, in Ian's house. Is that all? The odd Christmas do. Well, one dinner, the odd Christmas do, and you know the lady. Is that what you're telling us? How do you know she was neurotic? That dinner. Well, I mean, if she was being beaten, it's hardly surprising she behaved like a neurotic woman. I mean, she might have been told if she opened her mouth, she'd be battered again. Now, the phone calls. She was obsessively jealous. Yes, let's take this uh, last call in September when the accused was in Amsterdam. Right. 
She was hysterical. If, now before you answer this uh, question, uh, Mr. Lodge, remember you're on oath. Uh, did Mrs. Whiting at any time during that call mention another woman? She claimed that Ian hadn't told her he was going. Ah, that's what it was about. I mean, so any woman would shed a tear if their husband went abroad without telling them, wouldn't they? But I'm sure he told her. As sure as I am that he wouldn't beat her. It's not that sort. What sort? The wife batter her. Oh. And what sort's that? Well, it's the working man, isn't it? Get drunk on a Saturday night, go home and beat up the wife. You don't get educated men doing that. <laughs> well, your faith in the educated man, Mr. Lodge, is quite touching. No further questions, my lord. Uh, that is the case for the defence, my lord. Thank you, Mr. Lodge. Uh, members of the jury, the charge in this case is assault causing grievous bodily harm. And the issue is not whether or not the accused caused his wife's injuries. That's been admitted. But what was his intention? Mr. Whiting claims that he was defending himself from an attack by his wife with a knife. Now, a person's entitled to defend himself, provided he uses no more force than is necessary. He, he mustn't turn it to aggression or revenge. So, you must ask yourselves, did Mrs. Whiting attack her husband with a knife? And were her injuries caused by her own struggles and the force necessary to restrain her? In which case, you would find the accused not guilty. Or was the force used excessive? Or again, were her injuries just wantonly inflicted on her by her husband? If so, you will find him guilty. But if you have any reasonable doubt, your verdict must be one of acquittal. Now, will you please retire, elect a foreman, and consider your verdict? Members of the jury, will your foreman please stand? I'll just answer this question, yes or no. Have you reached a verdict on which you are all agreed? Yes. And you find the accused, Ian Charles Whiting, guilty or not guilty of assault, causing grievous bodily harm with intent to cause grievous bodily harm of Jennifer Whiting? Guilty. And is that the verdict of you all? Yes. Any previous convictions? No, my lord. Ian Charles Whiting, you have been found guilty. It In view of his previous good character and lack of other convictions, Mr Justice Stoddard sentenced Ian Whiting to one year's imprisonment, suspended for two years.